Good morning, and welcome to the Disaster Scenarios webinar series. My name is Erica Podest, and I will be your instructor throughout this webinar series. The material for the series has been assembled with the help of Elizabeth Hook, Sean McCartney, and Amita Mehta. This webinar series consists of three webinars. The first one is focused on tropical storms. The second one is focused on floods and will be on Tuesday, April 23rd. And the third one is focused on landslides and earthquakes and will take place on Tuesday, April 30th. The objective of this webinar series is to show you the data available to monitor different disasters and support decision-making activities. All of the different data products that will be discussed in this webinar series are freely available. Today, we will cover tropical storms and discuss the type of information that is available to monitor a tropical storm before, during, and after the event. The training objectives of this webinar are to identify the NASA remote sensing or model data relevant to tropical storms, be able to monitor conditions before, during, and after a storm, and understand how remote sensing data can be used in decision-making activities. We will discuss the remote sensing data sets available for tracking these events, their characteristics, and how to access and interpret them. Tropical storms are low pressure systems that form over warm tropical oceans. They're characterized by having high sustained winds, usually over 60 kilometers per hour, clouds and rain extending hundreds of kilometers from its center. Tropical storms are known with different names. For example, in the Atlantic and North, Northeast oceans, they're known as hurricanes in the Indian Ocean as cyclones, and in the Northwest Pacific Ocean as typhoons. Their intensity can vary, and they have different names accordingly. Anywhere from a tropical depression to a tropical storm to a hurricane, typhoon, or cyclone to a super hurricane or super typhoon. The bottom line is that these storms can have large impacts. Here we see charts on their impact by region from 1980 to 2009. The regions are defined by the World Health Organization and are colored. So the African region is blue, the Americas is red, Europe is green, and so on. The first chart on the left shows frequency of storms by region. And we can clearly see that during this period of time, most storms occurred in the Western Pacific region and in the Americas. The second chart indicates deaths by region and most of them occur in the Southeast region. And the last chart shows the affected population by region indicating again that Southeast Asia is the most affected. What's interesting is that the Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico and Pacific oceans have most of the storms forming. Everywhere else, there is small uh, frequency of storm, but the number of deaths is much higher in Southeast Asia. And this is perhaps because of its denser population and less preparedness. Here we show the impacts of tropical storms. The graph displayed here is specifically for the US, but these statistics are generally very similar for all tropical storm regions. The major cause of damage and death is because of flooding from storm surge and coastal flooding and storm related rain. So it's either because of coastal or inland flooding. There's also wind and surf damage and drowning in marine incidents offshore. And in some instances, tornadoes do occur and can cause a lot of damage. There are unknown causes, probably or possibly because people are not evacuated in time or roads are blocked. Generally what happens is uh, when a, a storm hits is that there's a hazard which causes exposure and the larger the area impacted, the greater the exposure. There's also population density and preparedness measures. All of those play a role in the actual impact. 
So storms not only claim lives, but they have an economic impact of billions of dollars, at least in the US. More detailed information on monitoring tropical storms for emergency preparedness can be obtained from RSET's introductory course in May 2018. The course is freely available online and you can access the recordings and the presentations through the link provided here. Today's webinar is structured such that we will discuss the data products available for monitoring tropical storms before, during, and after the event. Listed here are some critical questions during the different phases of a storm. Before the storm makes landfall, we want to know where it is and what are its characteristics, such as its wind speed. How much rain is it producing? Where is it going? And if there's a chance that it makes landfall, where and when might that be? And what will its wind speed and storm surge be? Where are the areas most likely to flood? Once the storm makes landfall, it's important to monitor the storm to determine its wind speed and the amount of rain it's producing. Where will it go and how will its wind speed change? What areas are flooded and what areas are likely to flood? What is the storm surge and what is it projected to be? After the event, it's important to assess the extent of the flooding and how fast waters are receding, as well as determine the extent of the damage. I'll first start with the description of the data products available to monitor the storm. There are several information portals that provide information about tropical storms. The World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, has a regional specialized meteorology uh, centers, as well as tropical cyclone warning centers that provide information about regional centers that have portals on tropical storms for different parts of the world. In the US, the National Hurricane Center is the main center that provides information about tropical storms. They provide current information on storms as well as outlooks and forecasts. The figure on the left shows all the regions where storms form as quadrants, which go from one through 13. Based on the number of regions, or, or based on the number of your region of interest, you can then go to the corresponding link on the table on the right. So for example, for the Central Pacific region, you'll be directed to the US Central Pacific Hurricane Center. If we go down that list, you'll see that the Northwest Pacific is covered by the Japan Meteorological Agency. The North Indian Ocean is covered by the Indian Meteorological Department. The Southwest Indian Ocean by Meteo France. The Southwest Pacific and Southeast Indian Oceans are covered by a number of Australian agencies, as well as the Indonesian Agency for Meteorology and Papua New Guinea. Finally, the South Pacific is covered by the Fiji Meteorological Service and the Meteorological Service of New Zealand. So these are the sites to go to to get dedicated information about origin, track, intensity, and monitoring information about the storm. This is all operational data. This chart lists the domain covered by three of the different centers. The Western South Pacific and Indian Oceans cover west of 180 degrees latitude and is monitored by the Japan Meteorological Agency. It updates its storm tracking information every six hours. The Central Pacific covers 140 to 180 degrees west and is monitored by the Central Pacific Hurricane Center updating its warnings every three hours. Finally, the Eastern Pacific and North Atlantic cover east of 140 degrees west and is monitored by the National Hurricane Center, updating its warnings every three hours. Next, I'll show you an example of the path of a hurricane named Harvey that occurred in August of 2017. This hurricane started in the Gulf of Mexico and made landfall in the state of Texas in the United States. It caused more than 100 confirmed deaths and an estimated $125 billion in damage. 
making it one of the costliest hurricanes in U.S. history. We will be using archived information from the U.S. National Hurricane Center portal to show the characteristics of this hurricane through time and interpreting five-day forecasts of its path and wind speed. These data are generated through observations from geostationary weather satellites, such as GOES East and GOES West, which provide images of the Earth every 15 minutes with a spatial resolution of 0.5 to 2 kilometers. The storm tracking information for Hurricane Harvey can be accessed through NOAA's National Hurricane Center website. Once you're in the main page, go to Archives in the top menu and select Tropical Cyclone Advisories. And once that new page um, has loaded, select 2017 and then select Hurricane Harvey under Atlantic Storms. And this will lead to the page shown here. Uh, and in the bottom right, you'll see all sorts of advisories. So let me show you directly on the web browser. Here we're in the North National Hurricane Center. Go to Archives and select Tropical Cyclone Advisories. Select 2017. And under Atlantic, we select Hurricane Harvey. And here we've got all of the uh, advise, advisories um, that were broadcast during the hurricane. And so we'll go to Graphics Archive to see the path of Hurricane Harvey. So what we'll do is we'll select five day with line. And this gives us a, an animation of the path of Hurricane Harvey. And this is the type of information that you can get from the National Hurricane Center in an operational way whenever there's a storm. So let's go back to our slides. And I'll explain a little bit about the type of information that uh, is provided in this animation. So the the, the series of images, of Im individual images, show the location of the hurricane and its potential track through time. And it's updated every three hours. And this goes from August 17th through the 30th. So the orange dot that you see there uh, indicates the hurricane's present location, while the cone, this cone that projects outwards, indicates its projected path. So the white area of the cone is the projected path for the next one to three days. So this white area. And then the meshed cone is the projected path four to five days out. The circles in the middle of the cone forecast sustained wind speeds. And the color of the circle is indicative of forecast position and can be black or white, where black is tropical uh, cyclone and white is the post potential tropical cyclone. The letters in the circle represent wind speed range, where D is uh, wind speeds less than 39 miles per hour, S wind speeds between 39 and 73 miles per hour, H 74 to 110 miles per hour, and M over 110 miles per hour. So also notice on the bottom that there are watches and warnings. A warning means that hurricane or tropical storm conditions are expected somewhere within the specified area that is colored red or blue. Uh, whereas a watch means that conditions are possible within the area colored pink or yellow. Because hurricane preparedness activities become difficult once winds reach tropical storm force, NOAA issues hurricane warnings 36 hours in advance of the anticipated onset of tropical storm force winds to allow for important preparation. During a hurricane warning, people should uh, complete storm preparations and leave the threatened area if directed by local officials. 
A watch means that hurricane or tropical storm conditions are possible within the specified area. And NOAA issues a watch 48 hours in advance of the anticipated onset of a tropical storm for force winds in an area. During a hurricane watch, people should prepare their home and review plans for evacuation. In case of a in case a, a hurricane or tropical storm warning is issued. So this slide is a summary of the information content uh, presented in the previous slide. Now I'll present another example of a tropical storm, and this one is outside of the United States. It formed off the eastern coast of Australia in February of 2019, and it's called Tropical uh, Cyclone Oma. The portal to track storms in the Southwest Pacific and Southeast Indian Ocean is that of the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. It's also known as BOM. There you can access current information and forecasts during the Australian cyclone season, which goes from about November through April. BOM issues tropical cyclone forecast maps every six hours and increasing it, these increase to every three hours when cyclone warnings are issued. BOM also uses data from the Japanese geostationary weather satellite Himawari 8, which provides full disk images every 10 minutes. And this is an example of the uh, bomb tropical cyclone forecast track map. And as you can see, it's similar to the NOAA National Hurricane Center um, forecast uh, track map. The blue circle represents the current location of the storm. The black circle is the past location. And the gray circle is the future location. So th this is the blue, the black here, and these are all future locations. The color of the solid circle surrounding the current position indicates the strength of the wind. In this case, dark red indicates destructive winds. Um, and here you have a summary of um, the different colors, right? So dark red is, means they're very destructive winds. A lower shade of, uh, uh, of red means that it's destructive. And then a pinkish circle means that they're just strong gale surf, um, force winds. The forecast extent of the winds is depicted by the different lines, different color lines, indicating gale force, which is 62 kilometers per hour, storm force, 89 kilometers per hour, and hurricane force, 117 kilometers per hour winds. A gray uncertainty zone or cone depicts the likely range of movement of the cyclone up to 72 hours from the time of issue. So this would be the likely range of movement of the cyclone. So next, I'll discuss monitoring rainfall and show several products that provide current and forecast rainfall information. So let's start with a great visualization tool that can be accessed through the link above. Uh, it is NASA's most comprehensive global rain and snowfall product to date. It's called the Integrated Multi-Satellite Retrievals for GPM, iMERGE. And it's computing, computed using data from GPM Constellation of Satellites, which is a network of international satellites. The global iMERGE data set provides precipitation rates for the entire world every uh, 30 minutes from the past, from the last seven, seven days. And this visualization is a preliminary near real-time data set of precipitation within several hours of data acquisition. So if, uh, if you go to the website, you can access a near real-time uh, video animation of global precipitation of this iMERGE product, updated every 30 minutes.
You can access the iMERGE precipitation product through the Giovanni link uh, listed here. iMERGE can provide daily precipitation, accumulated precipitation, and half hour rain rates. Its coverage is from 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south. So once you're in the Giovanni site, specify the dates of interest. And in this case, you'll extract data during Hurricane Harvey. So we'll specify August 25th through the 29th, 2017. And we'll specify our area of interest according to the coordinates uh, listed here. So I'll take you directly to the Giovanni site. Let's just copy these coordinates. And we'll go to the Giovanni site. And one thing is, in order to download the data, you do need to have an account on Giovanni. OK, so we'll select the date here in this box, our date of interest, which would be 2017, set August 25th through the 29th. And then we'll paste the coordinates for our area of interest, which defines the Texas area. And that's where Hurricane Harvey made landfall around the Houston area. And then here we'll select on the left hand side, you have a column, a list of measurements and we want precipitation. So note that there are 110 different precipitation products. And the one we want to select is the one from iMERGE. So we want to select this one, the multi-satellite precipitation estimate with climatological gauge calibration early run data. So you, you select it. And that is near operational, this data set. And then we will plot the data. And this might take a little while. But in order to plot the data, you need to have a, um, an, an account. Again, it's, it's free, but you do need to create a username and password uh, to access Earth Data Services. So while that's loading, here we have a description of the different GPM iMERGE products that you can access through the Giovanni website. So one is the early run, the other one is the late run, and then there's the final run. The early run uses a limited number of observations. It's a multi-satellite product approximately four hours after observation time. The late run is also a multi-satellite product approximately 12 hours after observation time. The main difference between the early and late run is that the early one has forward propagation, while the late run has both forward and backward propagation. So the final run the, for this product, the satellite gauge product, uh, it's about two to three months after the observation month. So the early and late runs are generated every half hour while the final run is generated on a monthly basis. So these are just uh, indicators on the PowerPoint on the type of product that you should select, at least for this exercise. And uh, when you do these at home, this is a, a guide to uh, what you should, um, that this will walk you through on what you need to do for this exercise. And so let's go back to our web browser. And here you have a time average map of precipitation over the area that we defined from 
uh, August 25th, 2017 through August 29th, 2017. And you can change this. So if you go to user input, you can change it and say you want to see an animation instead, for example. And then you, uh, you do a plot the data and it'll create an animation of precipitation every 30 minutes um, as uh, uh, during the time frame defined. So this is what that animation looks like. And you can see this is in millimeters per hour. So here we're going through August 29th. OK, so here it's starting August 25th. The hurricane is over the Gulf of Mexico. It moves over land. And you can see how much rain that hurricane dumped over that area. And then here's the accumulated rain during that period of time uh, for that given area. And you, th this hurricane dumped an enormous amount of water, uh, and it hovered over the Houston area for a couple of days, uh, as can be clearly seen here. So it, during that period of time, it dumped up to 30 inches in some areas. Another thing you can do with the Giovanni tool is to plot data, as shown in this example. And this is. Um, the iMERGE product centered in the Houston area for August 25th through 29. So on the X on the Y axis, you have precipitation in millimeters per hour and half hourly time on the X axis. So note that this is expressed in Zulu time. And the largest amount of rain occurred on August, around August 27th here. So also of importance is knowing projected rainfall. What I've shown here is, um, is current rainfall and, uh, and past rainfall. And what we want to know as well is projected rainfall so that the areas affected can anticipate or potentially affected can anticipate the magnitude of the event and take appropriate measures. So NASA's Global Modeling and Assimilation Office, also known as GMAO, generate such projections. They use the Goddard Earth Observing System, also known as GEOS 5 model, to generate forecasts produced in near real time using the most recently validated GEO system. These forecasts can be downloaded as net CDF files, uh, and they're time averages of hourly data forecasts up to 10 days. So the data that is produced or is is output is total surface precipitation flux. So you go to the link indicated here and you select forecast. So the products uh, are saved in uh, geographic coordinate systems with a horizontal resolution of 0 0.3125 degrees longitude and 0 0.25 degrees latitude. So in order to download the files, you select the HTTPS site uh, and then go through a series of folders starting with year, month, data, and forecast images. So the forecasts up are up to 10 days ahead. And you'll notice that there are many different file names in those folders, but you want to select the file name that is specified here. So it's the geos.fp.fcst.tAverage1. And then you've got a, a, a timestamp at the end. And if you want more information about the different files, um, the, the specific information contained in the different files, you can access this document. OK, so once you download that file as NetCDF, then you can open it 
in in your um, software of choice, whether it's ArcGIS or uh, Panoply or whatever can read a NetCDF file. And you choose the, uh, there's several files within that file and you'll cho choose the uh, precipitation uh, file specifically. Okay, so there's a, another a great portal out there. It's the GPM Tropical Cyclone Portal which is a, a very nice resource where you can get information not only about tropical cyclones, but about many other applications. Um, they post recent tropical cyclone events and they provide satellite imagery. So let's just go to that portal uh, right here. So you've got information on tropical cyclones, extreme weather, floods, landslides, uh, it's very comprehensive, and it's it's very much um, up, very up to date. Okay, so next we'll talk about data products related to wind speed. Uh, Geos Five Winds is a model product produced by GMAO, and they have a simulation products and forecasts. So in order to access these data, you go to the GMA. Uh, portal and select a simulation. So right here. And uh, you'll go through a series of different windows that pop up. Um, but you select uh, your year. Um, in this case, uh, we'll, we'll select data uh, relevant to Hurricane Harvey. So uh, you select the month and the days of interest, and then you download the files that have the following uh, file names. So it's asm.inst1. And again, these are NetCDF files that you can open uh, with any software that can read such files. So once you select the file, uh, you can download it. Again, in order to download it, you need to have an Earth Data Login account, uh, and you can uh, download it then for free. And these are NetCDF files, so you can open it with whatever software uh, you use that can read such files. And uh, you select the wind speed um, data file within that NetCDF file. And so here we have an example of um, a fo that file, the wind speed file from Hurricane Harvey in the Gulf of Mexico. And the scale is in meters per second. So the spatial resolution here, again, it's uh, three, 0 0.3125 degree longitude by 0 0.25 degree latitude. And the temporal resolution is, can be either hourly or daily. So those are for current winds. And then if you want to access information about forecasted winds, you go to the same site and you select forecast. OK, and these forecasts, they are up to 10 day forecasts. And once you're in the final directory, um, you select the file name that's listed here. So it would be fp.fcst.inst1 for the file that contains forecasted uh, wind information. Okay, so this is a plot of one of the data files downloaded through the previous step, and it's a 10 day forecast of surface wind speed, uh, again, displayed in meters per second. This is a global file. Uh, as seen on the left, and on the right is a zoomed image of a typhoon, a typhoon called uh, Wootip, uh, that at the time was forming off the coast of the Philippines. Okay, so finally, I want to talk about tracking storm surge. And uh, storm surge is responsible for 47% of 
that's directly attributed to hurricane deaths. Um, the, the there's a portal out there. There's a it's a, called the Sea Lake and Overland Search from Hurricanes model, uh, which is hosted on a portal, the Slosh portal, and it computes storm surge heights from tropical cyclones to create a model of the wind field using pressure, size, forward speed, and track data. This uh, portal is only applicable to the US, the east coast of the US, the Gulf of Mexico, Hawaii, Guam, Puerto Rico, um, and the US Virgin Islands in the Caribbean. You can access Slosh through the website listed here. So once you're in this web page in the Slosh, Slosh portal, uh, the, the graphics show probabilities of storm surge with tide exceeding 2 to 25 feet above the North American vertical datum of 1988. Uh, and so products are provided as a single 0 to 102 hour cumulative probability. Okay, defined as the overall probability that the event will occur at each grid cell from the start of the run until 102 hours in the future. Um, it's provided as 13 cumulative probability products with six hours spacing, defined as the probability that the event will occur from the start of the run until a specified time. So whether it's six hours or 12 hours or 102. So updates to the product are produced about one hour after the issuance of a routine National Hurricane Center tropical cyclone advisory. And you can download these files as shape files or grip files um, formats. So once you're in that website, in the Slosh website, you have a number of different options. And let's go directly to the website so I can show you some of the capabilities. OK, so in storm and year, let's select storm Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Um, these were the advisories that were put out every six hours. Um, these are the exceedance and probability products. Datum and then the time grouping are the six hour latencies showing incremental water level increase. So it's a cumulative total water height. And down here you have the option to animate showing above ground um, P search results. And you can download the data as either shape files or grids. So let's start an animation. And this is a time frame at every six hours down here. You see as we're cycling through. So this concludes today's session. And what I've presented here are examples of different products that are available. Um, and the idea is that you are aware of what is out there. There's no perfect product. It just depends on what your disaster is, what, where, you're where in the world you're located and what the best product is at that specific time frame for your specific location. So as part of this webinar series, we have homework assignments. The first homework assignment can be accessed through the link posted here, and it is due two weeks from now. So make sure that you complete these in order to uh, um, be able to get your certificate of completion at the end. So now we're ready to start our question and answer period. And the way that works is you'll type your questions into 
the question box and we'll be addressing each one. Thank you very much. For question one, um, the iMERGE data, which you, the late version or the final version that you get, um, they have rain gauge data merged into them. So one month of rain gauges around the world are collected from Global Precipitation Climatology Center or GPCC, and they are assimilated with uh, satellite merged data. So what you see over land from iMERGE, there are rain gauge included. And this is for late version. Early and, uh, I mean, final version, I'm sorry. Early and late version, they do not have rain gauges. But these data, um, even earlier, have been um, validated with, um, with rain gauges. There are special field campaigns, and then you can get that information from the website given up above. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Amita. So we have uh, Amita Meta and Sean McCartney online as well to help answer your questions. So please keep typing and we'll be responding uh, to your questions. Um, so this um, automate and schedule the download, they, these data are available in real time and you can write script to actually download them. If you go to BMM site and data access site that Erica just showed, um, all the servers are listed there. And I can um, try and find out. But there is a way you have to write a script and uh, as checking that the data are posted there and then you can download them. So if you go on GDEX, um, uh, there is a global storm surge model used. This is a European model. Is there a wind data product available for Asian countries? Um, so Geo uh, Swive data that Erica just demonstrated, uh, they are their global uh, wind data. So they are available for Asian countries. This is question four. Are these archive data? Yes, these data are all available. They are global data. Is average precipitation forecast based on specific meteor model? No, this is all. Um, the IMERS is not a forecast. It's a near real time product. So that is just blend of a number of national and international satellites, uh, and then again calibrated with rain gauge data for final version. So they are not available in forecast mode. They are mostly um, have latency of say four to five hours for near real time, and about a couple of months, almost three months for final product. But but the forecasts that Erica showed are from GEOS five. That's a NASA forecast model. Uh, can these data sets be published in another web platform for local use? Uh, they can be because they are open source data. Uh, but if you go and check on the website, you will have to you acknowledge where you got the data. And then you can modify and put them for your own region. So um, other than National Hurricane Center uh, that Erica showed, other than that, most products that she showed are all global. So uh, sea level pressure, precipitation, winds, they're all globally available. Uh, 
uh, uh, storm surge uh, monitoring, uh, we will, I will find out and will post it in, in the question answer session. There is a European model that does global storm surge. Um, I will find out that information and um, I believe that the introductory webinar we did last year also had that information. What are some ways in which remote sensing data is currently being used for disaster preparedness? So here in the US, uh, Federal Emergency Management Association or FEMA, they use some of the uh, remote sensing data for preparedness. Also Red Cross uses remote sensing data for disaster preparedness. And again, if you go to introductory webinar, uh, there are examples given where um, some of these data are used. But FEMA and Red Cross, they definitely use uh, some of these data. So can we get information about storms in real time? So it, there is usually, it's almost real time in the sense that uh, NOAA or other geostationary satellite images are available every 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, during the storm so that is almost real time other data they may have a little latency because by the time data are downloaded and then put on processed and put on website there is a little bit of processing time involved but if you looked at the animation that you saw from iMerge you sh it's every half hour so there's latency of half, half hour but you can still get a pretty good idea where the uh, intense storm is heading or where uh, already there is heavy rain so experimentally there have been uh, unmanned vehicle uh, or aerial vehicle flying above hurricane and that's real-time data but this is still in in research domain and not operational question 13 um, is there a list of term definitions for products and their their contents um, all the websites that are given with each product, they have uh, information or glossary about each of the products. And um, all, some of that information you will find in the webinars also. So question 14, there is usually a group of scientists working on model development, model simulation, model validation. So yes, it's a group of researchers or scientists. So it's not just uh, certain scientists uh, who, who produce forecast model, for example, taking in mind the uncertainty that comes with each model. So usually it's one model that a group works on. And then there are other organizations like NOAA or ECMWF uh, or Japanese meteorological um, agency. They all have their own models. UK Med Office, they, these models are there. And there are publications, intercomparison of these models that gives you idea of how these models differ from each other. So question 15, um, TRIM has changed its methodology. Um, so in if going in near future, so Later this year, there will be a new data set uh, will be coming out that will be a combined trim and GPM data. 
So going out in future, that will be the data that will be useful. It will start from January 1998 and then we'll cover trim era as well as then continue with GPM. So that entire data record will have the same methodology. So you can use that for climate logy purposes or variability examination purposes. Um, I don't think I understand question 16, but uh, you sh the difference between uh, you, you're talking about uh, morphing technique, I believe, in late. Um, early data are, as soon as some satellite orbits come in, data are, are put together. So it depends on how much data coverage is there. And for late, it is 12 hours or so of orbits coming in. So that morphing is possible. I, I, I assume that for forward and backward, you're talking about morphing. So I think that there's not enough data to do morphing in early run. So how compatible are these data? We, we recently compared with two different river basins and we found that IMERGE and TMPA were pretty close. Because TMPA has lower resolution both in space and time, uh, there, are, there are some differences. So they're not identical, but uh, they are pretty close. But for your own region, it's a good idea to compare both the products. Uh, and Giovanni can easily allow you to do that. Um, question to last two questions. Um, uh, is there an archive for rainfall data for Africa? Yes, there is. So trim data and IMERGE data. So you can go back to 1998, January, and those data are there uh, from trim and then later on from uh, GPM. Does projected rainfall data by GMO also cover? Yes, they cover, they cover Africa. I'm not sure about this plan to establish extreme value statistics by grid. But the uh, answer to these questions is yes, both um, rainfall data for Africa, they are archived 1998 onwards. If you are interested in, in lower resolution data set, which is Global Precipitation Climatology Project or GPCP, they are available since 1980, I believe. And GMO covers Africa, yes, projection. If you go to NASA GES disk, I think this data are available at WMS, but I will have to check, I'm not sure. So they are available at, as OpenDAP, uh, GDS, and Threads data through uh, GES disk.
Uh, yes, Slosh model is open source. I think it is available for download. This is the NOAA model, I believe, but I don't think it is for Asia. So there is, um, G uh, Europeans have a global storm surge uh, model, and I think you can get more information from this website here. So I don't think our Python MATLAB plugins are there on the sites that we showed. For data trigger, you may have to uh, write a script by yourself, but I can give you a contact that you can check with. And I, this is uh, strictly for precipitation data. For other data, uh, not sure. So here is the precipitation processing system site. And they have, uh, you can contact this through this website. And they might have some software. So question 23, that's an important question. GPM um, lifetime was actually three to five years. So it's already been four years now, or this is fifth year. So GPM is there, and there is, in, in NASA Decadal Survey, there is a new mission that will follow GPM. So precipitation measurements from space will continue after GPM. So GPM comparable to CMORPH or Persian data? Um, actually, yes, they are, it is comparable. They're all using multi-satellite data. Which one to use actually does depend on the area that you are in, your geographical region. We always recommend that you take all these products and if you have at least one or two rain gauges or any in situ data, you compare with your own data and come up with that answer because these data are validated, but not everywhere. So best thing would be to take all these products and see which work the best in your region. You also have to think what applications you're using them for, how much accurate you need the information on what time scale. So it, there are multiple things to look at when you decide on which product to use. So one can use statistical downscaling um, within precipitation GPM grid. If you have high resolution data, then you can come up with statistical downscaling. Uh, this has been done uh, in, at research level uh, in the US using high resolution radar data uh, within GPM grid. Um, and that, so you may want to search literature for that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Amita, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, it looks like no new questions are coming in. So with that, we will conclude this webinar. Thank you for joining. Remember, this is a three-part webinar series. The next one will be on April 23rd, and we'll talk about floods. And then the last one will be on April 30th. It's a Tuesday. And that one will be focused on landslides and earthquakes. 
There's also a Spanish session uh, that we will be uh, transmitting in about three hours, almost three hours from now for those interested in joining the Spanish webinar. So there's a homework assignment that is going to be posted on the RSET website, and that will be due two weeks from today. So each session is going to have a homework assignment. So thank you very much, and wishing you a, a good day, and see you next time.